First, um, my two main arguments, I've already touched on one, it's just that um, North Korea's use of nuclear weapons uh, uh, for political purposes, it goes against international norms, it violates what we think of as the rules of how to use nuclear weapons, and that is potentially destabilizing. Uh, the other main point that I'm going to want to touch on, it came up in the past, in um, the last discussion on North Korea, uh, but it's about how the regime in Pyongyang completely relies on its nuclear program for regime security. And it is, nuclear weapons are their primary, if not only, bargaining chip right now. So uh, those are the two points that I kind of want to lay out. Uh, what I'm going to do is go through uh, how I conceptualize stability in the context of North Korea and hopefully get some new ideas and debate going about that. Uh, then I'll go over the most recent events of the past two months in North Korea and try to bring the two together and uh, identify is North Korea's nuclear program really destabilizing. So first, uh, I, I looked at strategic stability. I used a lot of the work of Therese Del Pesh. Um, and in 2002, she uh, wrote um, this article with some other co-authors called A New Great Debate. And in it, she talks about how um, the Cold War, we all know how, how we thought of strategic stability during the Cold War. It was based on mutually assured destruction, two actors, and mutual vulnerability. With the end of the Cold War, um, we, we can't keep thinking of strategic stability that way. You have new actors, you have unpredictable actors, and uh, you're going to have new rules and um, new norms that you need to figure out um, how to find a, uh, um, you know, you have to you have to find a new form of stability. And so she offered a couple definitions for the new era strategic stability. I thought this was particularly useful. Strategic stability is um, to find ways to extend the nuclear peace of the past 50 years. It's pretty simple, but if that is what you make your goal, then you can rework the other factors that go into creating stability. And these were the six that uh, she offered. Uh, I'm going to go through them relatively quickly. But the first is uh, that you find peaceful resolution to regional conflicts. You do that by building on common interest. You avoid crisis escalation. Uh, the second is to maintain uh, deterrence and keep it strong. Uh, you may, and so for countries that are used to having nuclear weapons and understand the language of nuclear weapons, there's kind of this normative strategy of deterrence. You try to maintain that. You limit the scope of nuclear weapons to existential threats. Uh, you pursue multilateral arms control, and Delpesh recognized that this ha was patchy. It's not the arms control regime, non-proliferation regimes are not 100% effective. However, partially for the sake of norms, you do have to keep pursuing multilateral arms control. Uh, you also pursue non-proliferation efforts um, for nuclear and missile technologies. And um, finally, uh, you want to have established predictability, especially in regions where tensions exist. And she specifically discussed uh, the Korean Peninsula at the time. So uh, what I did was, instead of looking at this in terms of stability, I wanted to look at it in terms of, is North Korea destabilizing? So I took those factors that I had here, and then I just negated them. And so I said, in a de so a destabilizing factor would be if there is non-peaceful resolution to regional conflicts. Uh, and so a lot of these are going to be overlapping, but I thought it provided a good framework for what is um, instability. Uh, and so I put them into these three groups. The first is that there is a danger of conflict and crisis escalation. Uh, the other is that there is a prominent role of nuclear weapons and that you have poor control of the existing weapons. Uh, so what I'm going to go through next is looking at the recent events in North Korea and then come back to this and try to apply it to see whether or not these recent events really are destabilizing. So the past few months have been pretty busy in North Korea, as anybody who reads the news knows about. So these all kind of overlapped, but the um, Leap Day Agreement was that agreement in February where North Korea agreed to um, cease missile and nuclear testing and development in exchange for 240,000 tons of food aid from the U.S. And then, uh, obviously, in um, last month, they did test a satellite slash missile, depending on um, who you ask about it. And the North Koreans actually came uh, back afterwards and said, well, no, we told you that we were going to be testing this, and that was a condition of the agreement. So maybe there was some diplomatic uh, miscommunication going on there. Maybe not, and they're just 
coming, making that up. Um, so uh, there was the missile launch, which was a complete failure to the point that the regime didn't even try to cover it up. It flew 93 miles for one minute, and then it fell apart. Uh, then there was also this pictures of the quote unquote new missile that was unveiled at the parade to, um, for Kim Il-sung's 100th birthday. Based on my limited knowledge of missile technology and what I have read, this missile is not operable. Uh, it, a lot, lot, many pieces of it are just mock-ups, things that were just stuck on to look like a new missile. It, it would not work. Uh, and I mean, that just kind of gets to the root of why North Korea's nuclear program uh, in terms of conflict is not that destabilizing because it doesn't work. <laughs> they haven't perfected solid fuel technology. This is not a road mobile missile. Uh, and then there's also the issue of whether or not there will be another nuclear test. I argue that there will be by the end of the year. I'll get into that in a second. Uh, but it would fit into their cycle of past behavior. And then finally, 2012 is a very important year in North Korean legacy. It's the 100th anniversary of Kim Il-sung's birth. It's the 70th anniversary of Kim Jong-il's birth, and for the past uh, decade or so, for some reason, the Kim regime has been saying, 2012 is the year that we will achieve complete military and economic independence. So they've really been building up uh, on this, and there's a lot of pressure on 2012 to be a big year for North Korea. So there's a lot going on there. So how does that fit into uh, the pattern of past behavior? So as I've said, they rely on the nuclear program for regime legitimacy and as a bargaining chip. And I tend to think North Korea kind of has a mantra from, well, they don't know that they do, but it would be from Thomas Schelling. Um, when Schelling said, the power to hurt is bargaining power. And North Korea plays that quite well, actually, when you think about it. Um, the nuclear program itself is technically a relatively hollow threat, but they still use it for bargaining power quite well. Uh, and Kim Jong-il, in particular, did that very well, as I'll show um, on the next slide. So there are some questions as to whether or not Kim Jong-un will continue that, but the, the nuclear program is the root of the Kim regime. And just because there is a new leader doesn't mean that that cycle or their reliance on the nuclear program is going to change. The, uh, the elite, the military elite in North Korea are all completely dependent on the Kim regime. So it isn't like new leader everything changes. No, the new leader still is, has the same people behind him, and so there is a bit of um, just entropy going on, I think. So I actually built this chart after the 2009 test just to show how it all fit in. So if you start in the upper left-hand corner, North Korea does something bad. They usually do things in bundles as well, which is interesting. You think they did that in 2009. There was uh, a missile test, the nuclear test, and they announced the, uh, that Kim Jong-un would be succeeding Kim Jong-il, that all these things are all kind of mixed together. But so if they start, they have some sort of provocative behavior, the international community responds, levy sanctions, we think that sanctions bring them to the negotiating table, what, for whatever reason they come to the negotiating table, they get what they want out of it, and as soon as they get what they want, or like recently they didn't even get the food aid, but they, again, ha do some sort of provocative behavior. And it's just a self-perpetuating cycle. This is why we think of them as a petulant child. They just keep doing the same thing over and over again. But we are all, the international community also kind of plays into that cycle as well. Uh, and this is where I think the nuclear test kind of would clearly fit in, in the upper left-hand corner. Because things happen in bundles in North Korea, the nuclear test would fit in with the recent missile test, the military parade, and as I explained, the importance of 2012 for the North Korean culture. So um, what is North Korea destabilizing? <laughs> what are the, I don't mean as a rhetorical question, but what are those sources of instability in North Korea um, based on that framework I had? So first you have the risk of conflict, and here it's, you have a risk of crisis escalation since their nuclear program doesn't work very well, it probably wouldn't start with a nuclear exchange. Uh, it would probably be conventional. But what's the risk of that escalating? What's the risk of miscalculation? Uh, the second factor, which I think is the most important one, is North Korea's continued reliance on nuclear weapons as a source of regime legitimacy and regime security. Um, 
And then this quote that I pulled is by um, Kong Dang Oh from the Institute for Defense Analyses in Alexandria. And her argument, I think it applies, is that North Korea, when, um, when threatened, a porcupine sticks out its spines. In North Korea's mind, especially after the George W. Bush administration and that famous axis of evil speech, North Korea doesn't feel particularly safe. The Kim regime does not feel safe. What do they have to work with to ensure their own national security? All that they have is, this, is their military program, and that's all that they know how to work with. So as a result of relying on it, yes, it creates uh, some uh, hairy situations with their neighbors, uh, jeopardizes relationship with China, but it's all that they know that they know and all that they have to work with. And uh, the last factor for instability is uh, the potential for arms control. Uh, obviously, we know six party talks have failed, um, and they, North Korea is a history of proliferating missile and nuclear technology, which I'm sorry, I won't have time to go into in more detail. So how do you treat a petulant child? Thus far, we've been putting Pyongyang in a corner. Uh, my PhD thesis is actually on trust building in US-Russia arms control. So why am I here talking about North Korea? Uh, I really wanted to take some of the US-Russia experiences in trust building and see, like particularly Reagan and Gorbachev dynamics and their work at rapprochement and see would that work for something like uh, North Korea. I don't all mean to equate the, the Soviet Union with North Korea, but um, I thought it would be, um, it's an interesting exercise. So uh, Reagan's approach was, I identified these four prongs to it. Um, the first was linkages, where you have, for Reagan it was a four point diplomatic strategy. And somebody mentioned earlier in the Q&A, how do you account for human rights in North Korea? Well, the U.S already tried to do that with uh, the exchange for food, so that's one way. But if you expand that, make it also about um, economic collaboration. You can't just have your relationship be completely about their nuclear program. And by having a multi-pronged um, strategy, you can build momentum in some areas, as long as you keep the momentum going. For Reagan, at least, this was um, his main strategy. And so even if some parts of the plan don't work, others will, you just have to keep talking. Uh, the second part was small steps. Uh, for the end of the Cold War, uh, Reagan went to the, when Brezhnev died, Reagan went to the Soviet embassy and signed the condolences book. It seems like a really small thing, but many, pe many of the Soviets mentioned it, that it, was one, that it was the first time the president had done that, and it made them start thinking, maybe we need to listen to what the Americans are saying. I'm not saying signing a condolence book ended the Cold War, but if you get enough small steps going, you ha again, you have to keep building the momentum. Uh, you cannot ignore bad behavior, because that also is just hurting the norm uh, of uh, deterrence, nuclear control. And I think that was why the Leap Day Agreement fell apart, was after North Korea's missile test, Obama canceled it. So um, you also have to reassure your allies, and South Korea certainly wouldn't be happy if North Korea had a nuclear test and the US did nothing. And then finally, and um, also talked about this in his presentation, I thought it was really interesting, that what is the strategic vision for North Korea? Is, is there an end goal? If you read a lot of US strategy doc documents, they normally talk about, well, North Korea does this, North Korea does that. But what, what do we actually want out of them? Do we want reintegration of the Korean Peninsula? Uh, do we want regime change? Do we just want to engage them on arms control? There's a lack of strategic vision right there, and that was some, that was Reagan's um, key point when he pr started pursuing a, a strategy for um, engaging with Gorbachev. Uh, throughout this, you have to continue the message of deterrence, and you have to keep reassuring your allies um, in the region. So, I don't at all mean to suggest this is easy. This is really, really hard. Um, one example I, that is particularly hard right now, at least, is the U.S. domestic politics where after uh, the North Korean missile test, Romney came out and just slammed Obama for saying, how could you let them do this? And so Obama can't appear weak on North Korea. So that's just one example. There's tons, but I just thought this was, it, it just shows how, um, how to approach this is also driven by domestic issues as well. Uh, so in closing, uh, hopefully this raised some issues about strategic stability. We do often think of strategic stability in terms of conflict and uh, crisis instability and the risk of the outbreak of conflict. 
But there's also political aspects to stability, which North Korea is proving to play quite well. Um, and the last thing I threw, I just wanted th to throw out three questions uh, that I thought were interesting. Is strategic stability more than the absence of conflict? Uh, would a, another North Korean nuclear test destabilize the region? And is stability improved by treating North Korea as a pariah? Or is there a potential to re to reengage with North Korea, and would that actually increase stability? So thank you.